Yeah, welcome back to Community Matters here on Think Tech, the three o'clock clock on a given Monday. And uh, we're talking about um, failure, solution, and fallout. Where from here? And by two veterans who are talking about a commentary they wrote, uh, namely Vic Kraft and John Reese. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank okay. you. So uh, we got that we got that commentary. I thought it was very interesting and important that you wrote it, um, and we posted it on our our Think Tech blog. And we thought we'd have a show about it too. And I think this is very valuable um, to discuss your views uh, and uh, where you get that from. So the first thing you do, Vic, is tell us a little about your your background in life. Uh, hold it down to six hours, wouldn't you? Uh, okay, let me stop to the start watch here. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> take it from the, the, the brief bio that I sent you guys and what you know of me from years past. Uh, John and I were both in the Air Force at uh, Station Williams Air Force Base many, many moons ago. Uh, I raised him from a second lieutenant and uh, as, me as a staff sergeant at the time. Uh, I was interested in meteorology and wanted to. Uh, do it as a hobby, and uh, uh, I got uh, some master sergeant pushed him on me, and uh, we've known each other now for almost 50 years. So you uh, decided to collaborate on this piece. What brought you to collaborate on the piece? We've been writing together for a long time. We wrote a book together a long time ago called Pacific Cauldron. It was about what would happen to Hawaii should there no longer be a United States. Uh, and, in, and we've done some other things together as far as writing. We've been practicing this for years, uh, writing about uh, uh, defense issues, uh, space, uh, the environment, various other issues uh, around. Well, how, how important is this piece? Uh, it's, I, my guess is it's uh, like uh, maybe 1,500 or 2,000 words, um, and it goes into uh, pretty lofty thoughts and concerns about the future of the country. Um, but what what brought you to do this? And, and how important is this for you guys? For me, when I saw the, the uh, Afghanis running along the side of the aircraft, uh, trying to grab a hold of it, thinking that they were going to be blown away to safety, uh, it kind of motivated me to think about uh, giving service and also uh, what you're willing to commit. Uh, these guys just wanted to get the heck out of there. They didn't want to do anything. It seemed as though they didn't want to commit other than anything other than their own safety. And I thought of the sacrifice that we have made in the 20 some hundred lives of American uh, armed forces uh, people in Afghanistan. And what was it all for? And how did we get there? It's, it just made me ask the questions. Uh, okay, how we'll did go we into the piece in a minute. But John, what, you know, how much of what uh, Vic said do you agree with? Uh, are you coming from the same place? Well, we're both operating out of a sense of frustration more than anything else because uh, we're both we're both futurists. Okay, we both have an, an abiding interest in science fiction and you know looking at the future or whatever, and we both know how good things could be. And we're frustrated at the fact that, uh, you know, despite all of our technical sophistication and economic power and everything else, that we still seem to, well, basically shoot ourselves in the foot, you know, as Americans or whatever. It's like, uh, we can, you know, <laughs> Americans have a great, great talent for writing a really sophisticated, tightly knit plot you know, for a one hour show or a two hour movie. And it's like, why can't we do that? <laughs> why can't we do at least some of that in real life? I mean, plus, you know, we have, uh, you know, the, the, all this history behind us, you know, we've, we've done things right in the past, um, World War II. I mean, not only not only did we you know contribute to winning that war, but we had a plan afterwards called the Marshall Plan, and all that's on the shelf. It's 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 there. <laughs> okay, it's not 
it's not some uh, corporate proprietary information that's available to use. So it's frustrating for us to see us go into a situation like Afghanistan and we have all these ready-made blueprints, you know, sitting on the shelf or whatever, and nobody seems willing to make the effort or you know, make the effort to, uh, you know, put them, put them into practice. It's well, yeah, like, I guess what, you, you, what happened? What's the lens that you see this from? I mean, uh, both of you guys had long careers in and around the military. So um, I guess uh, maybe this is hard for you to answer, but what's the lens? How, from what point of view do you look at these issues? You mean the 30,000 foot level or? Uh... No, personally. Personally? Personally. Yeah, well, you know, Vic was Vic was an actual combat veteran in Vietnam. When I enlisted in 73, you know, Vietnam was still going on. I didn't happen to end up in Vietnam. My background was in when I when I entered the Air Force, I already had my bachelor's degree in applied mathematics, and the Air Force wanted to make use of that. So they decided I should be a computer programmer. But still, you know, my career went from 73 to 93. So I went from Vietnam to uh, Desert Storm. Well, a lot, of, a lot of people in the service who have been in the service, maybe I'm thinking of recent years, they, they treat themselves as apolitical. And some of them yeah. treat themselves as, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, conservative. And yeah. A lot of them support Trump um, right now, today. Um, yes, I, I mean, it's very that. troubling, troubling to um, my generation anyway. But so it's very, know, it's very troubling to me too. <laughs> I, I'm, well, you know, I, 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 I like to think of myself as apolitical, you know. But uh, you know, I've been through, I've been through the Carter years, I've been through the the Reagan years, I've been through the Clinton years, and everything else. But you know, the idea is that. Uh, well, there's good to be found, there's good and bad to be found in both sides. So, you know, I, to this day, you know, I, I consider myself a, an independent voter. And uh, Trump is anathema. I mean, he, <laughs> he, he, is, he is the worst example of American politics in my book. And, and I... I I can I can find virtually zero worthwhile in 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 uh, him in particular and his enablers within the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's not to, that's not to say that I'm a that I'm a fully committed Democrat, you know, because I think they have their issues also. But let, let me come to his defense yeah. in this regard. I think both of us view our view. We view ourselves as Americans first uh, in terms of what we raise our right hand for in terms of su supporting yeah. the Constitution. Uh, that's, I mean, the principles and ideals that were set up uh, in the Constitution and what that's what we we put a uniform on for. And when I see people storming the Capitol and I see people trying to grab onto an airplane uh, to get their freedom, recognizing that they're both giving up. The people who stormed the Capitol gave up on the, on the processes and the system. They were willing to abandon the law and take the law into their own hands. The people in Kabul who were trying to get on board these aircraft had abandoned whatever they were, uh, uh, they were living in for fear of losing their freedoms or whatever. We fought for those freedoms. 22 or 2,400 people died for those freedoms. And Thousands upon thousands of Afghani soldiers also died. And these guys are thinking, I'm going to grab onto an airplane or I'm going to crawl over these other people to get, get my freedom and get away from them. Uh, I, I have no, no sympathy for them. Uh, and I have, uh, I have no sympathy for the people on January the 6th who gave up on America. They should be looking at themselves as being Americans and not just Trumpers or, or anything. Uh, I hate labels in that regard. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go, let's go to your, uh, your piece, your commentary. It's, it sure. covers three things, which is why we fashioned the name of the show as uh, 
failure, solution, and fallout. So you, you, you spend a, a, a bit of time writing about the failures. And I guess it's driven, Vic, it's driven off the Afghanistan experience. But yes. can you summarize what you're saying about the, the failures in your paper? I, I think John said it earlier, it's kind of like a, a proper pre-planning prevents piss poor performance. If you're gonna go invade somebody, you've got a plan. And then if you're gonna have a plan, you're gonna have some means of what defines what your goals are. I don't think we really had any goals in Afghanistan. Uh, it was interesting, one of my mentors called me up the day after 9-11 uh, occurred. And he was an uh, army intelligence officer. And he said, you know what, we're gonna do something stupid. We're gonna go down the military industrial path to try to uh, fight these people in Afghanistan and in Iraq. No, no, the, the, the way to do this was to follow the money. It was also to uh, be uh, clandestine in fighting this thing. And we, we did not take any kind of uh, lesson out of Vietnam in that we were gonna put boots on the ground and this is how we're gonna solve the problem. Uh, it doesn't. And that's one of the things that we wrote about in the, in the uh, piece is our foreign policy has been driven by defense and a paranoia as opposed to the other way around and that our foreign policy should be driving defense policy. <clears throat> I constantly hear the business of American interests. What are those interests? Protecting American interests, what are they? And uh, delineated where? And you read the defense posture plan that comes out what every five years or the uh, decennial uh, report. And you think, okay, why do we have all this military? We have the largest armed forces in the world in terms of uh, carriers, uh, other weaponry. What for? What are we using it for? Are we concerned about banana republics invading the United States? Okay, so um, these are failures. What, what would you add to that, John, in terms of the, the treatment by your joint paper here about these profound failures? Uh, failures about which uh, you and Vic are concerned. Well, it's, you know, Vic summed it up pretty well. Um, you know, it, it, it's, the, it's the lack of, of setting, you know, clear objectives that, uh, you know, okay, ostensibly we went into Afghanistan because the Taliban government that was in place at the time was sheltering Al Qaeda, and Al Qaeda launched the 9/11 uh, attack. So we wanted to not only eliminate Al Qaeda, we wanted to eliminate the group that was supporting them. But we accomplished that. We chased Al Qaeda, you know, Al Qaeda out of out of Afghanistan, it took us several more years to finally track down Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, but uh, you know, we, we accomplished the first, the first goal and we, we uh, knocked the Taliban you know, out, of, out of government there or whatever. But we essentially went in with no plan of what to replace it with. And not only that, we went in with no plan uh, for an Afghan government. We went in basically with wishful thinking that once we eliminated the Taliban, the Afghans would rise up and embrace the principles stated in the U.S. Constitution and set up a, a uh, you know, set up their own republic, you know, or democracy in the shape of the United States government. Well, they have no experience with doing that. We needed, we needed to set up a, you know, we needed a, a plan to set up uh, an Afghan government, not, not, a, not a copy of the U.S. government, because they, they had, you know, they have different structures there. They, they had, uh, you know, village chiefs. They had, uh, you know, various uh, other, uh, you know, ethnic minorities and things that, that we just ignored. And it's like, you know, we went in with, with a plan, you know, cross your fingers and hope that they form a government after we, after we take care of the Taliban. And, 
you know, we, we finished we finished the first two goals within a matter of one or two years. And then what what what, what did we spend the remaining 18 years doing? You know, trying to prop up a government that wasn't working. Yeah. Jay, there, there was some a combination of failures there. Um, yes, yeah, let, let me let me say yeah. something, Jay, because uh, this is something that uh, has troubled me for the last 60 years. A guy by the name of William Letterer wrote some very interesting books back in the 50s. One was uh, uh, All the Ships at Sea, Nation of Sheep. He was also co-author of uh, The Ugly American. And he pointed out the failures at that time of the American diplomatic policy uh, in Asia. And I stopped to think about this. When we went into Afghanistan, I'm sure that there were people who were sitting on the desks of the specialists, of these uh, subject matter experts within the State Department, who were probably feeding memos to their management saying, this is a bad idea. And it, it, it got distorted. Okay, so yeah, it, it say no, no proper pre-planning to go in there. And uh, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a retired diplomat. And uh, I said, you know, he had been to Kabul and uh, uh, been uh, talking with Hamid Karzai several times. And I, and I asked him, I said, uh, just exactly what is Afghanistan? Uh, considering that it has had a history of a lot of warlords, uh, you got a lot of uh, uh, drug use or drug uh, uh, production going on over there. How do they make a living? And I said, uh, Afghanistan seems to me to be about a 60 mile radius around Kabul. And he said, oddly enough, uh, Ahmed Karzai had turned to him and said, yes, his writ does not extend beyond the city limits. So exactly, we did not know what the heck to do and didn't do our homework, went in there. That's a huge failure right there. We're going to so just who, go who's invading. responsible? Is it the military? Is it the no, State it's Department? Is, it's is it Congress? What do you mean uh, by us? Uh, are the, are the you American and I and, and John recharged with knowing all these things? We didn't yeah. have any authority to do anything. So no, query the people with the authority to do something. Who made the mistakes? Yeah. Well, we're a democratic republic. We are a democratic form of government. We are supposed to have our representatives represent, represent our views. Given the, uh, the feeling of the American populace today and uh, its lack of advocacy in its own institutions, well, that sounds pretty far. I fully yeah. but it's the, the idea is that people are frustrated and they don't trust mm -hmm. in their own system. How did we get out of Vietnam? It was the pressure of the public on its, uh, on its uh, representatives. It, it took a while to do it, but at least it was a matter of numbers. And once the numbers grew and people uh, or the, the representatives recognized their constituents were not happy, guess what? Things started to change. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I suppose that people around the country were not fully aware of what was going on in Afghanistan, and maybe they should have been out in the streets protesting and writing letters to Congress, which they didn't do. Uh, most most people went along with it. And let's assume for this discussion that you know there were huge failures, failures by all the government agencies involved, including you know presidents, the intelligence agencies, the military who never really learned how to speak the language, right. um, and uh, and of course the State Department. And and the coordination of all of them, you know, for 20 mm -hmm. years. But let's go, let's go to the second area of your discussion. Um, John, you know, you talked about solutions. You and Vic came up with three or four solutions. This is really important because we're we're on a you know a constructive track here. We want to find answers so that these failures are not repeated. What are your right. solutions, John? Well, first and foremost is, uh, you know, if if we admit the fact that, you know, the, the failures occurred due to what, what amounts to poor leadership, you know, the first solution is we need better leadership. But then how do you, you know, it's easy to state, but then how do you go about doing that? And quite frankly, in today's current political environment, you know, things, things are, you know, they talk about polarization. Well, that's a very apt description, okay? 
It's uh, divided between, you know, liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans, and the definitions have been distorted, you know, to the point, you know, where you know, uh, a conservative from 50 years ago wouldn't recognize the conservatives, you know, the contemporary conservatives. But be that as it may, uh, our failure seems to be stemming from, quite frankly, our two-party system. Uh, our elections, you know, every election night, they talk about the swing voters, the independent voters, that you know, each, each party has its own base that seems to be locked in, but the, deci you know, the final decisions seem to be made by the swing voters, and yet the swing voters don't have any representation. Okay, so to me, as a mathematician, <laughs> the, the solution seems to be we need a third party. Now, do we need a third party to completely take over, you know, uh, dominate the politics? No. Uh, there's already been talk in the Republican Party of Republicans dissatisfied with the Trump supporters. And there was some talk a few months ago, apparently not too serious, but you know, some, some spoken speculation that oh, maybe we ought to break off and form our own party, to which I was gonna say, yes, pull the trigger, do it. Because if these more moderate Republicans separated from the, the, the Trumpists, okay, Trumplings, you know, whatever you want to call them, uh, that would immediately eliminate them as, you know, they, they wouldn't have their majority anymore. You know, they wouldn't have a threat of a majority in either, in either house of, of uh, Congress, in, you know, in either chamber of Congress. Uh, Rick, what about the solution? other possible solutions that you included in the paper? Oh, well, we talked uh, about uh, national yeah. service. We also yeah, talked well, about... Vic and, I, Vic and I, as members, you know, members of, of, of the of the military, and oh, by the way, as a retired Air Force officer, retirement is not a discharge. <laughs> I, I am I am still officially a member of the U.S. Air Force. Okay, I'm, I'm my my status is retired, but uh, I, I you know when I when I you know retired, I did not receive a, a discharge. Okay? I wasn't separated from the service. I'm still part of it. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is you know, and Vic ha has the same, you know, his technical, his legal status might be, you know, not the same as mine, but his mental status and in, in, his, in his heart, it still is, okay? But we recognize the value of national service. And we have other examples on the planet. Vic is always bringing up Switzerland. Okay, everybody in Switzerland ends up doing some national service at some point in their life. And whether that's in the military or some other function, you know, in the United States, we have the Peace Corps, we have, you know, other things like that. We could make up things like that. But you, know, you, you got to get, you got to get involved. You, you got to, as, as we put it in our paper, you got to get some skin in the game. You got you to have some investment. Too many people nowadays, you know, they're they're sitting, you know, comfortably, you know, with their uh, their big screen TVs and uh, you know Sunday afternoon sports and and whatnot. And you know, the the whole idea that after Vietnam we we formed this quote all volunteer force. Uh, well, that more or less gave uh, gave Congress and, and the president, you know, the executive branch carte blanche, you know, do whatever you feel like, because, uh, you know, we've got these volunteers that have agreed to, to you know, follow our orders <laughs> or whatever. And, uh, you know, there, there's no investment, you know, there, there's no protest from, from the moms and dads and it, well, you know, a few moms and dads or whatever, but not a, not a voting block. John, let me let me add to that because this is one of the things, uh, uh, Jay. I think that's uh, important as far as the skin in the game aspect of this thing. How much debate has gone on since 
we left Afghanistan. I haven't seen anything in the press. People aren't talking about it. I don't know whether they're ashamed or uh, of what happened there, but there, there doesn't seem to be anything other than recriminations against the current administration. That's all their fault. Now, we as a, as a country are responsible for this. We are a democratic republic. We, ha we uh, elect our uh, representatives to go to Congress that are supposed to speak for us, or at least they are to speak for their district. And if their district is against a particular issue, then they need to raise that. And that's where the leadership comes in. Now, uh, John mentioned the Republicans having some uh, difficulties in keeping everybody in line. The Democrats are having the same problem in Congress right now. Yeah. And perhaps maybe we will get some leadership out of this. I don't know, uh, but it's, yeah. it's a matter of what you're willing to accept. Uh, one of the uh, congressional delegates to uh, Washington from uh, Hawaii has shown that kind of uh, leadership in, in bucking the system and saying, no, I don't want to do it uh, your way. There is a better way. If, uh, if Vic, if I could jump in here, if 10% of the Republicans left the Republican Party and 10% of the Democrats joined them, forming a block of uh, 20% of the current representation or whatever, uh, that would have a moderating effect on the other two remaining parties. Yeah. Because each party with their 40% share, you know, their plurality, whatever, would you know, would be um, trying to get that 20% swing vote or whatever enlisted in their various causes, which would cause them to moderate their policies to try and attract that, that middle 20% block. Well, I want to get to, to Jay's question regarding the getting to the how. And we, yeah. we started that at the beginning of the program. How do we go about doing this? Peter Adler wrote a very interesting piece in Civil Beat last week. Uh, he called it guerrilla bridge building. Uh, and basically, we know that Peter is a, a, a mediator. Uh, that's his specialty. But I recommend that you go read the, the article. It's very good. And basically brings about the idea that we work at these things a little bit at a time, and we don't take issue with the other people as, as far as putting labels on it. You find collaboration. And that's what we need to do is find collaboration. How we go about doing it, it's, it's, it's I don't know, one step at a time, Jay. I don't know what else to do. Yeah. But it's, it's a matter of I've invested my life in the Constitution and the ideals of this country. I'm not willing to give it up. Okay, we're almost out of time, guys. Uh, so, John, let me ask you for a minute of closing remarks um, of how you want to leave this with our viewing audience. What would you like them to remember from this discussion? Well, we, we have to uh, encourage the idea that, uh, you know, that, that, that collaboration and cooperation are not, are not dirty words, okay, <laughs> that both both sides of an issue can have some constructive thoughts and compromise doesn't have to be a process of whittling away until the only thing that's left is mutually abhorrent to both parties. Compromise should be surveying the points of both, of both sides and picking out the good things from both sides and then synthesizing those together to produce something greater than the original whole. Okay, compromise should be a, a building uh, effort, not, not, a, not a destructive effort. Hey, we and, gotta leave it there. Uh, yeah. Rick, uh, what would you like to leave with our audience? The former Hawaiian legislator, uh, said to me one time, because politicians have such a, a bad reputation with the public, he said, politics is the art of compromise. And that is one of the things that we need to work on. And the problem, as we've pointed out in, in our article and also uh, in, this, in this interview, 
is the lack of people wanting to compromise. And that's why I get back to Peter Adler's business of uh, guerrilla collaboration. Uh, it, you, we've, there's got to be some people that are going to be willing to stand up and say, uh, I'm not going to follow the dog. And I think of uh, John F. Kennedy and Profiles and Courage and the, the people that he wrote about and what they stood for. And there is no, as Kennedy said, no Republican answer or Democrat answer, just the right answer. And that's what okay, we need to look for. Vic Kraft, a veteran, a Air Force veteran, and John Reese, another Air Force veteran, been around the block and writing together for years and been thinking about our situation, both true patriots. Thank you very much, Vic. Thank you, John. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. Aloha.